This is Regis Program, and you're tuning into Two School Sports. I make smart investments. That's why, right now, with this huge academic, I mean, uh, with this, with this, with, with this, with, with this huge shit that's going on, all this crazy stuff that's going on, my investments are still paying off. Many are called, but few are chosen to be the face of boxing. To be the face of boxing means more than just being a great fighter inside the ring. You gotta throw fans outside the ring and cap captivate the imagination of millions upon millions of people the world over. In today's video, we'll be looking at, you know, the last two faces of boxing in today's current face of boxing, Canelo Alvarez versus the previous face of boxing, Floyd Mayweather. Um, these are two fighters that, for their own reasons, are polarizing figures in the sport of boxing. And these are two fighters that in many ways have helped carry the sport of boxing and keeping its name alive and keeping things going. Um, I don't really think Canelo Alvarez is that great of a face of boxing. I, I think it's almost disrespectful to call him a face of boxing. And I'll get into that later on in the video. But today we're going to compare, you know, how these guys became pay-per-view stars and the routes they took to get to where they were at. So stay tuned. I'm sure you'll enjoy the video and uh, subscribe. No matter what the media say, no matter what the trainers say, when it comes down to it, it comes it comes down to the two competitors. And I and I know what I can do. And I know what I can do. One thing I can do, I can fight. When we talk about lending on a higher percentage, I'm that guy. When we talk about doing the highest gates, when you talk about doing the highest gate, I'm that guy. When you're talking about doing the highest pay-per-view, I'm that guy. 19 years, and I reflect back over my career. I can't just say I'm, I'm, I'm going out 49 and 0. You can never overlook anyone. In this camp, did I push myself? Absolutely. Every fight played a major key. All 48 fights played a major key. It's not, just the, it's not just the intelligence, it's the sharp mind, it's the good chin, it's the tremendous heart. I never overlook no opponent. I train for every fighter the same way. I push myself. I believe in my skills and I believe in my talent. And I've been in there with the best. And the results is always the same. A guy, a fighter, you got fighters that may be faster than me. You got fighters that may hit harder than me. You got fighters that's very athletic. But you don't have no fighter that can make adjustments like me. You don't have fighters that can be on my level mentally. It's never personal for me. It's always business. Every, every other fighter fight for certain things. Everybody fight for what they fight for. My thing is this. I keep my eyes on the prize. I never focus on things outside the ring. My focus is the guy that's in front of me. You get to where you're trying to get to by staying focused, staying on a parallel path. I always had a dream. And my dream was to be the best. No matter what happens, Saturday, when it comes down to boxing, I'm the best at this. But one thing about me, I've never overlooked anyone. Some guys, some guys game plan, we gonna, we gonna rush him. Make down, we gonna rush him. Okay, what's your second game plan? That's plan A, what's plan B? Pacquiao, he can set the trap for other fighters. But you can't set the trap for Floyd Mayweather. 
because you got to have plan A, you have to have plan, have plan B, and have to plan, if you don't have a plan B, then you go to plan C. I've never beat a fighter with my A game. Hey, what's going on? It's your boy BT, and I came here to talk some boxing with the thousands of True School Sports subscribers. Now, that man to my left on the t-shirt, or above my left shoulder, is one of the most polarizing figures in the world of boxing in modern day history. You know, for many reasons. Uh, you could you could be somebody that thinks that he ducked every he ducked all these fighters in his career, which he did. He did he did duck some fighters in his career. Um, and that he fought nobodies and you don't want to give him credit because you just think that uh, his career is extremely manufactured and if, that's what, if you're one of those people, fair play to you. Um, you could hate him for his authoring issues, which we don't need to highlight, but we know, we know what I'm talking about with Floyd. But one thing we can't say about Floyd Mayweather at all, at, in terms of just pure boxing and his skill set and his technical abilities, is we, we can never say that his skills were never up to par. We can never say that his, um, you know, his his boxing skills were manufactured. If you go the Floyd Mayweather's career from the Olympics to the amateurs to the early days of him as a prospect to him being a contender to him being champion to him being a reigning champion. His skills were always up to par. You can never, ever, 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 ever in your life say that about, about Floyd Mayweather. And it's for these reasons that uh, eventually Floyd Mayweather became one of the biggest pay-per-view draws, if not the biggest pay-per-view draw in the history of the sport. So to, in today's video, as I, as I said earlier, we're going to look at Floyd Mayweather and Canelo Alvarez as pay-per-view attractions and as the face of boxing. And we're going to look at how they got to what they got to. Okay, so we'll start off with Floyd Mayweather. Um, obviously, with Floyd, he he was on the '96 Olympic team for the U.S. I believe he won a silver medal as he got robbed against was it Augie Augie Sanchez? I think his name was. Um, turned pro, signed a contract with Bob Arum and top rank whatnot. Okay, um, people with Floyd's career, I think people, especially younger boxing fans, they they they, they don't understand that. And, and listen. This is speaking as somebody who is a former Mayweather hater. I mean, as a kid, like, look, I got a Manny Pacquiao shirt to my right. I grew up a fan of Pacquiao. That was my guy. As, as a kid, growing up, you couldn't say nothing bad about Manny Pacquiao. Um, I love Manny Pacquiao. And to this day, I still, I still love Manny Pacquiao. Manny, Manny Pacquiao is one of my top five favorite fighters of all time. Got massive love for the Pac-Man. So because I love Pac-Man as a kid, you know, when, when you like one guy, you know, genuinely, you're going to dislike another one. And I, I, I didn't really like Floyd Mayweather. And I was young. And I was dumb, and I didn't know what I was talking about. But the guy is a great fighter. Even even back even back then when I was a kid, even when I hated the guy, you know, to myself I always said, "Damn, that guy, that, that, guy, that, that guy could fight his ass off." But I never said it out loud because I was, I was, I was a Pacquiao fan, right? So that being said, um, as time has went on, you know, as time time and distance from his career, and you know, from people not fanboying from anymore, it's really made me appreciate Flamengo other. Um, as I've gotten a chance to go in his career and objectively, objectively look at to where he got to where he got to, you know. Um, aside from that, you know, Canelo Alvarez, and listen, I don't want to make this a Canelo hate, a Canelo hate video because that, that, that's not what this video is for. But um, Canelo Alvarez and some of the ways he's went about his career and just how corny he is in general have made me appreciate that man a lot more. So um, I can almost say that because of Canelo, I've, I've become almost a Mayweather fan. Because of Canelo, it's crazy. I never thought I'd say those words because I was a big Pacquiao fan as a kid. I love that guy to my right so much, but I've legit become a Mayweather fan because of how how Canelo has a career has played out and just all that stuff. But objectively, objectively looking at Floyd's career, looking to where he got to in his career, this was a guy in Floyd that he he didn't just wake up. He didn't just wake up and and and, and start his career and fight on pay per view. This guy had to earn everything he got before he became Money Mayweather and became the biggest uh, box office attraction the sport has ever seen. Um, if you go back as early as his ninth fight in his career, his ninth fight in, Floyd Mayweather's ninth fight in his professional career, this guy was fighting Kirk Johnson. I kid you not. This guy, fought, th th this guy was fighting on Kirk Johnson's undercard in Biloxi, Mississippi. Okay, On the undercard of Kirk Mother Lovin' Johnson, whose claim to fame is pulling out the... the Pulling out of the Lennox Lewis fight, okay? He fought on his undercard in some crazy, some some random town in Mississippi, and that's what it was. If you want to go ahead even further, when, when he was a bit more advanced in his career, in, 19, in 1997, about two fights before he fought Janeiro Chiquinito Hernandez, he fought on Janeiro Chiquinito Hernandez's undercard, um, and he wasn't even the co-main event. 
people, people, people don't even know this. In 1997, when Floyd Mayweather fought under on Janeiro Chicanita Hernandez's undercard, he wasn't even the co-main event. So, like, Carlos Hernandez fought Janeiro Hernandez on that particular card. Um, that was November 20th, 1997, at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles, California. This is this is this, this was Floyd's what 11th or 12th professional fight. He fought a guy named Angelo Nunez, who was 14, 11, and three. Floyd wasn't even no co-main event. He was not even no co-main event. Lucia Riker, Lucia mother loving Riker, was the main event. Okay, no 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 disrespect to Lucia Riker. She's a fan. she was a hell of a, she was one of the best women's fighters of all time. Great fighter. But I'm just saying, I'm saying that to say that Floyd had to really pay his dues before he got to where he got to. So we're talking about fighting on Kirk Johnson undercards in Biloxi, Mississippi. We're talking about fighting beneath Lucia Riker and Gennaro Hernandez before he uh, he became world champion. Okay. If you look at his career, and I challenge you guys to go look on go, go look for yourselves. If, if you look at his career, Floyd what did was not afforded the luxury of fighting. On a big star pay per view cards to build himself up. You know, a lot of time, a lot of times in boxing these days, we'll see a we'll see fighters attach themselves on the undercard of another big name fighter, and that's how they can prop their name up. I'll give you an example. My favorite fighter is Roman Chalatito Gonzalez, and when he came to the states, he had to often fight on Gennady Golovkin undercards, which you know, in, in, in my opinion, listen, I think he's a much better fighter than Golovkin. No disrespect to Golovkin. Um, but he had to fight on Golovkin's undercards because Golovkin had had the bigger fan base and was more known. Um, we see it now these days. Um, we see it now these days all the time. Anthony Joshua, even when he was in the UK, he fought on Carl Frotch, some, some of Carl Frotch's undercards. Like when Carl Frotch fought George Groves in front of 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium, you know. Um, he had to attach his name to another big star from where he was at. Floyd didn't really do that at all. If, if you go look at his career, he didn't really do much of that at all. So that, that's actually, that, that, that actually makes his rise to prominence even that much more interesting to me, right? So then he was on HBO. He had fought, you know, a lot of guys and was whooping up on them. But like before Floyd even hit pay-per-view, because his first, his first pay-per-view was against Arturo Gatti. Um, before Floyd Mayweather even hit pay-per-view, okay, on regular HBO, we're, we're talking regular HBO, no pay-per-view, no back-end pay-per-view upside. He fought Gennaro Hernandez in his, what, 17 professional fight or whatever it was, 17 or 18 professional fight, became champion. He fought uh, Angel Man Freddy, who had a really good uh, year that year when Floyd fought him. He had, I think he was coming off a win against Arturo Gatti and another guy. But, he, man, Freddie was a good, a good contender at the time. He fought him here in South Florida at the Mikasuki Resort in Gaming, which is kind of crazy to think because I've covered a fight there, and it's always crazy when I go back there, and I, and I think to myself, yo, Floyd fought here because <laughs> the place is so small and so rinky-dink, and it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. So he had a fight in dumps like that, okay, as a, as a, as a young pro in big fights. Um, and then he fought uh, Jose Luis Castillo two times. You know, the first fight he lost controversially, or he won controversially. In the rematch, uh, won, it, won it easily. Uh, and then he fought, you know, the very game and the very tough and, you know, sometimes avoided Emmanuel Augustus, who was a good fighter at the time. People people, people look at the record and say, well, he was whatever, but he was a lot better than his record indicated. And, he, and, he, and you can get beat and embarrassed and look, made to look like a fool if he fought Emmanuel Augustus. So he had to fight these kind of fighters before he even got to pay-per-view, okay? And he had to fight and really pay his dues for, for what, 17, 18 fights fighting in the middle of nowhere, in undesirable places that nobody wants to fight. Which is why sometimes when I watch these cards, like I watch like, I'll watch like, um, Matchroom Boxing, the zone cards, right? And you see these, you, you see these young fighters like Ammo Williams, no disrespect to Ammo Williams, but Ammo Williams and, and Nikita Abibi and these young prospects. And these guys are fighting on Madison Square Garden and in all these big venues, their second, third, fourth fight. Yo, Floyd was fighting in dumps, absolute dumps, his 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th professional fights. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't get to big time boxing um, as quick as a lot of these younger fighters are. So people can hate on Floyd. People can say that he, that he cherry picked in his career, that he was a diva. But you know what? Unlike a lot of fighters in boxing in, in modern day history, he actually earned the right to, he actually earned the right to do that. You know, I'm not condoning who he, I'm not condoning him ducking fighters, but I'm saying, unlike a lot of fighters, he actually paid his dues to get to that position. Okay, so that that that's Floyd, basically in a nutshell. That's Floyd, pre pay per view. And if you want to take it a step even further, uh, in 2005 when he fought um, 
Henry Brucellis at the American Airlines Arena in Miami, and he was one of the top two or three pound pound fighters in boxing. They sold less than 5,000 tickets, and this was when Floyd was pretty boy hitting you with eight punch combinations. This was Floyd when um, he was clean cut. You know, he wasn't really controversial. You know, this is this was the Floyd that everybody should have got behind. But meanwhile, less than 5,000 people are going to watch him fight. So it was clear to it was clear to Floyd at that point in his career that he he needed to make a change and he needed to do something to get himself out there to the public because it was clear that top rank and that the persona he had at the time wasn't cutting the mustard. So that's pre pay per view Floyd. Now getting to pay per view Floyd, okay, his first pay per view as many of us know came against. Arturo, you know, the late great R.I.P. Arturo Thunder Gotti, okay? This was the first pay-per-view fight for Floyd Mayweather. This was, you know, obviously a shot, a very shot Arturo Gotti who had gone through the Mickey Ward wars and trilogies. Um, this is not the Arturo Gotti from, you know, 2001 or, or the 90s. This is a very, very worn out and beat down Arturo Gotti. And it was one of the biggest pay-per-view mismatches in boxing history okay but commercially speaking the fight did all right you know he did 340,000 pay-per-view buys which is not bad uh, considering that Floyd wasn't a big name at the time um, in terms of worldwide and, and, and you know Gotti was shot so not, not, not the worst number in the world and then uh, Floyd had began to fight a whole host of uninspiring competition following that you had Floyd Mayweather uh, following that fight, you know, the first fight was the Gotti fight. Let me pull it up because I want to make sure chronologically. I want to make sure chronologically I stayed in order because I, I wrote it down in an, way out of order. So the first pay-per-view fight was uh, Arturo Gotti in 2005, just after the Henry Brucellus fight where he sold less than 5,000 tickets, right? So then you get Floyd and you see Floyd. You know, he fought, uh, where is it? I think I wrote it down. Did I write it down? He fought Sharambe Mitchell, but I'm not sure. That, was that pay-per-view? I think it was, but I don't think I wrote it down. He fought Sharambe Mitchell, which was, believe it or not, Sharambe Mitchell was his last fight before he, um, which was his last fight ever outside of Las Vegas. So the last time Floyd ever fought outside of Las Vegas was November 19th, 2015, uh, 2005 against Sharambe Mitchell. But then after that, it was straight pay-per-view pay -per -view from there on out. Uh, he then went on, he fought uh, Zab Judah. That did, what, 374,000 pay-per-view buys. So a slight uptick from the uh, the Gotti fight, you know. And this is Judah coming off a loss to Carlos Baldemir. After that, he fought Carlos Baldemir, and, and that wasn't really too good. That was his lowest pay-per-view rating of all time, 325,000 pay-per-view buys. So you see Floyd's first three pay-per-views, okay, his first three pay-per-views um, were not even touching 400,000 buys, okay? So you gotta understand, Floyd was fighting on Kirk Johnson undercards in Mississippi. He was fighting beneath Lucia Riker um, on Janeiro Hernandez undercards, and he fought a whole host of, tough, of, of some solid opponents before he got to pay-per-view. So then three, not, you know, three whatever pay-per-views as far as the numbers go and then his big breakthrough finally came in 2007 when he fought Oscar De La Hoya and that's when Mayweather really got into the driver's seat of boxing and never looked back never looked back he fights Oscar De La Hoya in his 37th professional fight so I want you guys to think about this everybody talks about Floyd and how he cherry, how he cherry picked his whole career and how he managed and how he, how he micromanaged everything and to, to a certain extent he did um, in the second half of his career, but it took this man 37 fights to get into the driver's seat of boxing. It took this man fighting on Kirk Johnson undercards in Biloxi, Mississippi, fighting beneath, beneath Lucia Riker on Janeiro Hernandez undercards, fighting the likes of Janeiro Hernandez, Angel Manfredi, Diego Corrales, Jose Castillo, Jose Luis Castillo twice, and then Emmanuel Augustus before he even got to pay-per-view, okay? And then three pay-per-view duds as far as the numbers go. Before he had his breakthrough. So then he fights Oscar De La Hoya. Beats him. 2.4 million pay-per-view buys. Floyd Mayweather has now broken through and, and become a box office attraction in the sport. People wanted to see him get beat. He adopts the money Mayweather persona from that, from that moment moving forward. And he becomes the number one target of hate amongst boxing fans. Okay? So then he never looked back. Um, after that fight, he fights Ricky Hatton in what was the, one of the biggest... 
events this country has seen between an American and a British fighter ever. Um, that fight did, where is it, 920,000 pay-per-view buys. So it was obviously a, 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 you know, a decrease from the De La Hoya fight, but still a good, solid showing at the box office. And, and a fight that, culturally speaking, in terms of cultural impact, that fight moved the needle. That fight absolutely moved the needle. Um, it, it meant something, okay? And he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he showed pound for pound level skills in that fight when he stopped Ricky Hatton with a left hook going backwards and knocked his ass out. So then after that, he fights Juan Manuel Marquez, another uh, Mexican pay-per-view star. One million pay-per-view buys. Great show, great, great, great showing there. Uh, Shane Mosley, you know, another, another, you know, big name fighter, a fight people wanted to see for many, many years. You know, that did, where is it? That did one point four million pay-per-view buys. So one point four million pay-per-view pay 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 buys against Mosley. You know, he fights Victor Ortiz next. Victor Ortiz, 1.25 million pay-per-view buys. After Ortiz, he fought uh, Miguel Cotto, 1.5 million pay-per-view pay -per buys. Uh, Robert Guerrero, what do you do against Guerrero? I got it somewhere, I got it somewhere. Where are you at? Uh, one million pay-per-view pay buys against Guerrero. This, this, that was the first uh, fight on the Showtime deal. And then he fights Canelo. At this point, he fought Canelo. But, 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 but by the time he fights Canelo, that's Mayweather with what? One, two. Since the De La Hoya fight, he's what? One, two, three, four, five, six. He's six fights removed from establishing himself in the driver's seat of boxing. And they and they build this guy Canelo up to beat him. They did cra crazy numbers in that fight. Uh, they did 2.2 .2 million pay-per-view buys at the time, which is one of the biggest in, sp in, in boxing history. Did a, an incredible gate. Um, fights Maidana. What is it? <laughs> Where are you at? Where are you at? Maidana one. 900,000 pay-per-view buys. And then Maidana two, there's a 925,000 pay-per-view buys. So Maidana two actually did more pay-per-view buys than Ricky, the Ricky Hatton fight, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and then obviously, he shatters every pay-per-view record imaginable when he fights Manny Pacquiao and does 4.6 million pay-per-view buys. Um, you know, and then, then he has the Andre Berto fight, which I'm not even going to lie to you guys. I bought the, I actually bought the Andre Berto fight which still did 550,000 pay-per-view buys. So even against the Andre Bertos of the world, Floyd was such a big star that he could sell over half a million pay-per-view buys against Andre Berto. And then his pay-per-view career closed out when uh, he fought Conor McGregor and did uh, 4.3 million pay-per-view buys, which was less than Pacquiao, but the gate, the gate in the revenue he generated was actually higher. He takes 600 million in revenue. So, you know, just the Pacquiao and McGregor fights alone, Mayweather is pushing upwards of a billion dollars in, in revenue. And not just that, like people can say what they want about Floyd, and you know, I, I will not. I'm not even gonna argue this because I've, I've, I've said I've said this myself. I think a lot of fighters have tried to adopt the Mayweather philosophy and blueprint without actually taking the Mayweather route and putting in the Mayweather work because he didn't just wake up and, and get to that point. He had to fight on Kirk Johnson undercards in Biloxi, Mississippi. He had to fight beneath Lucia Riker on Janino Chikinito Hernandez undercards. He had to fight a whole string of tough contenders before he even got on pay-per-view. And then even when he got on pay-per-view, there was a three-fight period where he wasn't he wasn't like culturally move, moving the needle like that from a pay-per-view marketability standpoint as far as with his buys. So he had to really put the work in it. It took, it took Floyd Mayweather 37 fights before he got into the driver's seat of boxing. Now, once he got to, once he got into the driver's seat of boxing, he never looked back, and he, you know he won an, an amazing run in terms of commercial success. And it, it, it you know, it, it's been great for his career, and I think he's given fighters, uh, young fighters, a blueprint on how to take more ownership of their career. But it's put fighters in a mentality of entitlement, of 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 um, self-preservation, and they don't really have that dog that Mayweather had early in his career, you know? A lot of fighters have become pussified because of they look, they, they look at the last 10 fights in the middle of his career, that they see the, the buys against Maidana and, and Pacquiao and, and Hatton and Mosley and Cotto and all these guys, Canelo and De La Hoya. They look at all these, all these amazing events, but they forget and they don't have any context as to what he actually had to do to get to that point, you know? And it was a lot he had to do to get to that point. So, it's just a much, much different route than, let's say, somebody like Canelo went through to get to where he's at. And we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that now.
All right, so we're gonna we're gonna take a look at Canelo and how he got to where he got to as the quote unquote face of boxing. Because I wanna I wanna put some proper context onto where he got to where he got to because it's a lot different than Floyd Mayweather. Before we get into what I'm gonna say, just a full disclaimer here, and I don't wanna even hide this. I don't, I don't even wanna hide it. I wanna be honest with you guys because I'm an honest guy. I am a Canelo hater. I don't like him. I don't like nothing he stands for. I think he's corny. I think he's a piss stain on boxing. But we're gonna look at where he got to, where he got to in his career, just the facts, not my feelings, just the facts. Okay, so Canelo Alvarez is right now, in terms of pay-per-view attractions and pay-per-view numbers, he is the number one box office attraction in the sport in terms of America, you know. Globally speaking, I don't think he's as big as Anthony Joshua, maybe not even as big as a Tyson Fury, because a lot of his fandom and people that know him, awareness-wise, cultural awareness, comes from Latin American markets and the American market. But aside from that, I don't think he's really, I don't really think he's moving the needle like Anthony Joshua or even Tyson Fury. Is my opinion. Um, but Canelo Alvarez, he's been had he's had the face of boxing title thrusted onto him because of the fact that in America, um, nobody was doing numbers like him. I mean, if we if we can go back as far as the James Kirkland fight, which was 2015, um, that fight on on regular HBO did the highest rating on HBO boxing at that time. San Antonio Tara versus Bernard Hopkins, which was in 2006, um, and it, it it came the the irony of it was it came just one week after Mayweather Pacquiao, which was such a horrible fight and left a, a sour taste in a lot of people people's mouth. But um, you know that that right there kind of goes to show you the kind of star he 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 wants to become. Um, before that, just taking it back a bit, before that, you know, his first introduction to the pay-per-view market and model was to fight on Floyd Mayweather undercard. So this is so much, this is, this is a lot different than what Mayweather experienced. You know, obviously Canelo, as a, as a pro, he turned pro very um, early in his life as a young man in Mexico at 20, at, 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 20, and at 15 years old, he was a kid. He was a kid when he was a pro in Mexico. And he had a whole string of fights before he got to Floyd. But um, in terms of pay-per-view, Canelo, his initial introduction to pay-per-view wasn't even out as a main event fighter. It was out on the undercard. He fought on two Floyd Mayweather undercards before he fought Floyd Mayweather on his first pay-per-view. He fought on the Shane Mosley undercard against... Um, who did he fight? I got it right here. He fought uh, as a co-main event. Yeah, from, uh, he fought on the co-main event of the Mayweather Mosley undercard. He fought against, uh, oh no, my bad. He fought as the co-main event on the Mayweather Cotto undercard against Shane Mosley. And then he also fought Jose Miguel Cotto on the Mayweather Mosley undercard. So he pretty much, you know, he, he, he was able to really jumpstart his career and fast track himself to, to becoming a pay-per-view star because both those fights combined did nearly 3 million pay-per-view buys. So that's 3 million people who had a chance to get their eyeballs on Canelo before he became a pay-per-view star and attraction, okay? So that does a lot for a fighter's career when you're fighting so late into a pay-per-view card slot. You know, as a co-main event on a big on a big card like me with Dakota, which did 1.5 million buys. You know, that, that, that gives you a lot of push moving forward as a fighter that, that you know, a guy like, you know, Floyd didn't get, you know, as as a young fighter in his career. Floyd wasn't fighting on no Oscar De La Hoya uh, co-main events under the cards in his career. He was regular HBO or random undercards somewhere in, like, Bilu Biloxi, Mississippi on a Kirk Johnson undercard. So this really, this really jump-started his career. And then by, by the time he got to Floyd, mind you, he had been afforded the opportunity to fight on multiple Mayweather undercards, big Mayweather undercards, pay-per-view fights. And on top of that, and on top of that, he also is was being pushed as and touted as the next great Mexican fighter. So he had all the Mexican fans behind him, which is big because the Mexican fans really get behind their own, much like the British fans. They get behind their own and they support. And especially if a promoter anoints them as the next great Mexican fighter, they're gonna get behind them. So like, if you go back and watch the press conference in LA at the Nokia Theater, I think it was, I mean, oh my God, Canelo hadn't done shit in his career. To be honest with you, at that point, when he fought Floyd, he hadn't done shit in his career. He had done nothing in his career to warrant the hype he was getting. But the fact that De La Hoya, Golden Boy Promotions, all of them, all of them they pretty much anointed him as the next great Mexican fighter. And with, 
being that he was undefeated, being that they called him the one, you know, the one, um, they're labeling him as the one to beat Floyd Mayweather. And the fight was a box office success. 2.2 million, million pay-per-view buys, one of Floyd's highest uh, pay-per-view sales of all time. It actually, at, the, at that time, it set the record for the highest gross pay-per-view fight which was at that time 150 million. So it was a, it was big for Canelo. He had now announced himself as um, the next pay per view attraction in boxing, even despite the loss. And he was going to be on pay per view uh, for many many years to come. So after that, he fought um, you know the likes of Arizona Lara and uh, Alfredo Angulo on pay per view on pay per view cards. Um, much like Floyd, he wasn't able to crack 400 thousand pay per view buys either in his first two pay per view buys. But it's a bit different though because unlike Floyd, he had he had the he had been afforded the chances to fight on massive pay-per-view undercards as a younger fighter he was a mex a, a, he was getting so much push and so much promotion from mexican media oscar de la hoya golden boy promotions all parties involved so it's not quite like when floyd was flopping on pay-per-view um he wasn't an instant an instant success on pay-per-view um but then you know as time progressed and time moved forward um, you know, he fought the likes of uh, Amir Khan on pay per view. Did six, did six hundred thousand buys. Was a successful card. It was a it, it was a fight that moved the needle, and it was a fight that you know cult, was culturally impactful. Uh, same thing with um, Miguel Cotto. Another fight. You know, Miguel Cotto, a massive fighter, big name, a big you know standalone pay per view draw in his own right. You know, they they came together and they did nine hundred thousand pay per view buys. Um, and then obviously, you know, he, he, be, he created his own weight class, which is one of the corniest things ever seen in boxing. He fought Liam Smith at not 154, but 155 at Canelo weight. And he turned in his most trash pay-per-view numbers of all time at Cowboy Stadium when he fought Liam Beefy Smith and did 300,000 buys. And then from that point forward, he fought Gennady Golovkin and he touched, uh, he fought Chavez Jr., Gennady Golovkin twice, and he's been 1 million and up. So pretty much... Um, after the Mayweather fight, because if we look at Canelo Alvarez, hold on, I'm going to pull it up right here, hold on, give me one second. So after the Mayweather fight, he fights Mayweather in um, 2013, does two dud pay-per-views with Ngulu and Lara in terms of buys, fights on free HBO against James Kirkland, does a, does two, does one monster pay-per-view number with Cotto, solid one with Amir, uh, 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 with, with Amir Khan, does a trash one with Liam Smith, but pretty much after the Mayweather fight, it took him, what, one Two, three, four, five, six. It took seven fights for Canelo Alvarez with all the promotional push he had behind him, with all the Mexican media anointing him as the next great Mexican fighter. It took him seven pay-per-view. Oh, no, no, my bad. Not seven. It took him what? One, two, three, four, five. It took him six pay-per-view fights to break one million pay-per-view buys. It took him six, okay, when he finally fought Chavez Jr. And the only reason that the only reason that broke uh, a million buys is because of the whole, you know, Mexican thing. You got the Chavez Senior dynamic, so that's what it was. And then you know, both Golovkin fights were box office uh, draw or box office successes. They both went over a million buys. But I mean, when you consider the promotional push that Canelo Alvarez has had in his career. And the fact that it took him six pay-per-view fights to get to a million pay-per-view buys, fighting on Mayweather undercards, fighting Mayweather, being anointed as the next great Mexican fighter, um, I think it lends credence to my point, which I've been saying for a long time, that Canelo Alvarez, while he is a big star, is not as big of a star, and his star power is extremely overrated when you compare it to the likes of a Floyd Mayweather, or even a, even a guy like, like Manny Pacquiao, extremely overrated when you compare it to a guy like Manny Pacquiao or Floyd Mayweather. He doesn't quite stack up to, to those guys, especially a guy like Floyd, because Floyd Mayweather, once he got into that driver's seat, he never looked back. But the difference be between the two is that Floyd Mayweather knew how to market himself. He wasn't boring. Like, 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 like Say what you want about Floyd in terms of, uh, of who he is as a person or what he's portrayed out there over the years. But one thing you can't say about him is that he's boring. You can't say that he's boring outside the ring. Canelo Alvarez, on the, on the other hand, he's got the personality of this wall. I mean, this wall with nothing on it, you know? Boring. Extremely boring. And that's why I've always said, like, his, paper, his, his, his personality is very, very just boring. And his star power is overrated because outside of 
hardcore boxing fans, sports fans, and Latin, the Latin, Latin American market, nobody knows who the hell he is. Nobody knows. You can't go to Africa and people know who Canelo is. You can't go to, you know, even unless, unless it's boxing fans, the average Joe Schmo on the street in England isn't going to know who Canelo Alvarez is. Hell, I live in Miami, one of the, uh, you know, biggest markets for Latin America in the world. And I know people here in Miami who don't even know who Canelo is. Plenty of people who don't know who he is because he's not moving the needle like that because his personality is boring and he don't transcend boxing. So he had all these things going for him, all these things. And I'm not, I'm not saying he's not a big star, but he had all these things going for him. He got to piggyback off Floyd's success and star power, and he still didn't transcend the sport of boxing. So I'm just saying, you just can't quite compare Floyd to, 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 to Canelo Alvarez in terms of as far as fighting. They're definitely not fighting. Definitely not fighting. But um, just saying, man, it's a big, big difference in how they got to where they got to. And I say that I say all this to say, and as a as a as a former member of the Bay Mother Haters Club, I um. I'm saying this to say that everything that man got in his career, he earned it the hard way, fighting in Biloxi, Mississippi on Kirk Johnson undercards. So I don't want to hear a damn thing from anybody about him being manufactured because while he might have, while he might have done some messed up stuff in his career and ducked some fighters that we, we, we really want to see him fight, not taking that away from him, not ignoring that at all, one thing we can't say about his career is that you know as he progressed through the levels of boxing that he was manufactured that he was you know or that his skills went up to par because they were and he's gonna go down when it's all said and done right now 50 years from now as one of the all-time great fighters in boxing and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have more Mayweather Canelo videos coming out so stay tuned here on True School Sports for all that moving forward but let me let me know what you guys think in the comments down below Take the time to subscribe, and like I say in every single one of these videos, you can love me or you can hate me, but I'm just a kid from Daniel. So until next time, take care, guys. This is Chick Shane Mosley, and you're watching True School Sports. All right.